thank you for joining. Um, now, okay, so I would like to now, without further ado, um, introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, the presentation will go for <clears throat> probably a bit under an hour. And then Emma has said she's, um, she has, she's uh, quite happy to take questions. So again, I see somebody's already typed a question into chat and we'll be looking at those after she uh, concludes her presentation. So without further ado, let me please introduce our speaker, Dr. Emma Kennedy, who is a coral reef ecologist <clears throat> and research fellow at the Remote Sensing Research Center, University of Queensland. Emma's diverse research um, has included um, monitoring the effects of climate change on reef communities, using acoustic centers, sensors to assess reef health, um, and even investigating a tiny pink seaweed, which might be the key to recovery of the Great Barrier Reef. So she may um, enlighten us on that this evening also. Um, Emma's uh, project brings together remote sensing specialists, mapping specialists uh, from the UQ and other places as well. Uh, coral reef ecologists, geomorphologists and conservation agencies. And certainly the atlas of uh, map, the atlas that she has been involved with producing over the past few years is going to be very significant resource for many people perhaps some in the audience tonight. Um, just want to congratulate Emma uh, before we turn over to her. She uh, will be leaving Brisbane, uh, sadly for us, of course. Uh, she has just been appointed to AIMS, the Australian uh, Institute of Marine Science in Townsville. And she'll be moving to Townsville probably in mid-January. So congratulations, Emma. And we wish you all, all the best in your new uh, position. And I'm sure you'll be doing great things up there for the reef. So I'm now going to turn over to Emma to share her presentation with us. Thank you, Emma. Can everybody see the screen? Is that working? Yes, it's working fine. Thanks, Emma. Fantastic. And everybody can hear me. <laughs> I can hear you, yes. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. And thank you to the Society for hosting me and the opportunity to showcase some of our research as part of your monthly speaker series. And good evening to all of you joining. Thank you so much for logging on. I wasn't expecting such a huge audience. Um, I'm live streaming to you from my home in East Brisbane, which always was and always will be the country of the Turbul and Yugara traditional owners. So I'd like to just start by acknowledging them and the 70 traditional owner groups whose land and sea country include the Great Barrier Reef, which is where a lot of our, our research is done and where lots of the photos you'll see in the presentation this evening were taken as well. And so this evening, I'm really excited to share with you um, some of our lab's efforts as part of a broader partnership to develop a detailed coral reef habitat map for the whole world, which is something that um, as a coral reef ecologist was amazing to me that didn't exist when we began the project in 2017. So I know we have a pretty broad audience joining us tonight, and I wasn't sure how familiar everybody here was with coral reefs. So I'll just take a little bit of time um, to convince you, if you weren't already convinced, that coral reefs are amazing and worth mapping. Um, and then I'll spend most of the presentation showing you some of the exciting techniques we've developed at UQ to map reefs from space. And finally, we'll go through a few ways that um, you could get involved too, or we might be able to collaborate if you're interested in um, taking it a bit further. 
So to begin, why should we care about reefs? I think there are three essential things about coral reefs that make them important and relevant. And I'm pretty sure that you'll be familiar with at least two of them. So the first thing is that they are beautiful. And of course they're beautiful because they're packed full of biodiversity. So even though they take up a very small proportion of the ocean, 25% of all marine species use coral reefs at some point in their life. And there's a huge representation of different animal phyla in these ecosystems. Um, so very exciting places to work. Coral reefs are also threatened, which is something that I'm sure you also knew. And actually we all know it very well. The science is very clear on the causes of degradation to our coral reef systems. Um, things like overfishing and destructive fishing, pollution, coastal development, cyclones, and of course, climate change, warming and ocean acidification, um, which is really coming to the forefront as a kind of uh, extreme threat to reefs at the moment. And the great, our own Great Barrier Reef, of course, has seen three bleaching events in um, the last five years. And a recent study that came out last month actually estimated that about 50% of the corals have been lost since 1995. And last year, the government actually downgraded the status of our Great Barrier Reef from poor to very poor. And climate scientists are continually telling us that unless we can limit um, temperatures to within 1.5 degrees of additional warming, we're likely to see very dire consequences for most reefs in um, the coming years. And we're currently tracking towards three degrees. The third thing that you might not have known about reefs is that they are essential. So not just scientifically and aesthetically, but also culturally, economically, and socially, we actually really depend on reefs. Here in Queensland, um, reefs um, support a lot of jobs and generate a lot of income for Australia each year as well. But actually in Australia, we're not as reliant on reefs as some other countries are. So in the Philippines, coral reefs protect millions of people's homes um, from storm surges every year. And in Indonesia, which has, I think 28% of the world's coral reef fishes, there are about 1.7 million people directly fishing reefs. In total across the planet, there's about half a billion people that rely on reefs directly, either for their food or for their jobs. And so the destruction of reefs that we're seeing at the moment is really looming humanitarian crisis. And that's something not many people are aware, aware of. And on top of this, we don't actually know that much about coral reefs. And that's why we're hoping that science can be important in helping us understand some of these resources a little bit, a little bit better. Um, so I'm a coral reef specialist um, and I'm trained in zoology and ecology. And I'm pretty sure my mom and dad think this is what I do all day, um, but I wanted to reassure you that the reality is definitely a lot less glamorous. So we do get to spend a lot of time scuba diving. It's true, I probably spend a few months a year up on the reef. Um, and we get to go to some pretty incredible places. Um, but for anybody that's spent a whole day on a boat or several days uh, on a boat, you'll know that um, sitting in a wetsuit for seven or eight hours of your day often involves sitting in your own wee for large amounts of time. And um, if you're seasick like me, there's a lot of vomiting off the boat as well. And of course, there are a lot of different types of marine biologists out there and I've never been the cool kind that works on sharks. So my job title would probably be more accurately described as a benthic coral reef ecologist which means that I'm very focused on the part of the reef that's stuck to the floor, the benthos. Um, and I'm, so I'm interested in all the different species that are making up the benthos and how they're behaving and what they're all up to. And the ecology part means I'm not just interested in them as individuals, but I'm really interested in how they're all interacting with each other. So are they competing? Are they eating each other? Are they symbiotic? Um, like who's, who's, who's important? And then on top of that, um, ecology is how these organisms are also interacting with the environment and how these relationships are influenced by the environment. So kind of like a really complicated web. And of course, environmental factors help explain a lot about where these different organisms are found. And um, particularly as reefs are becoming more threatened, 
it's becoming more relevant to understand um, some of these connections. So things like rising temperature, how is that affecting some of these different organisms and their relationships as well. And throughout my um, short career, I've been very lucky to use my interest in this subject to work on a number of different projects um, in Australia. So one was looking at the biology of this amazing hard pink algae called coralline algae that plays a really important role in reef recovery. Another was developing a global conservation strategy for reefs that took into account the fact that we were seeing massive degradation because of warming oceans. And another was monitoring reefs in the coral triangle using a Google Street View style underwater camera. So some pretty fun jobs there. But um, definitely the most exciting project I have ever been lucky enough to work on is um, this mapping um, reefs from outer space project. So it's called the Allen Coral Atlas. And I joined the team of remote sensing specialists at the University of Queensland um, back in 2017 to help them map the first ever um, complete detailed habitat map of coral, of coral reefs. So as a biologist, joining a team of mapping experts, it really got me to thinking about why we need to map. And there are a number of reasons that humans love to map, from making sense of the natural world, to being able to catalog our resources and take stock of what we have. And of course, um, to navigate our way safely around the reef is important as well. Um, maps definitely help us gain insight and make discoveries, I'm not just talking about buried treasure, but for example, Darwin and Wallace's coral reef maps of Indonesia help them develop their theories of evolutionary biogeography. Maps help us tell stories and add vital context to our work. So um, in scientific publications, we often start the publication with the figure one and that will be a map so that we can ground our research in um, space and time. And finally, important role of maps are bringing us together. And so creating conversations that lead to collaboration. And this is a really a major goal of this mapping project, um, just communicating ideas without having to use words. Um, and finally, I think that maps can really inspire us as well. I'm sure there's many of you that have gone and had a play on Google Earth and um, been really inspired by exploring new places that you haven't been to visit yet. So mapping essentially is a really human thing to do. We use maps every day and they can be incredibly beneficial for our science and conservation. And of course, we've been mapping for a very long time. The Polynesians would navigate across the Pacific using star compasses. And here in Australia, um, dreaming tracks in the sky were used for long distance travel at night when temperatures were cooler. Um, and you can even see, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this constellation, it's Scorpius, but the, um, the tail end of Scorpius actually mirrors almost perfectly the A55 road from Carnarvon National Park down um, to northern New South Wales. And so song, song lines and star maps often correlate to landscape features that can be seen today. So mapping's always been a very important part of us exploring and understanding our landscapes. And of course, stars are a great way to navigate the ocean, which is kind of featureless. Um, but obviously, if you want to map what's under the ocean, it's really not that easy to do for the simple reason that we can't easily view what's under the surface of the ocean. And we're a little bit fortunate with um, coral reefs um, because they famously grow in nutrient poor, very, very clear waters. And so early explorers were able to have a go at mapping some of the reef structures just by um, being able to view them um, through boats or climbing hills and looking down on them and really get like start to get quite a good idea of, um, of how these structures were distributed. And so probably the first attempt at a global coral reef distribution map was by Charles Darwin. In, uh, he, he created a map in 1842 um, from his time on the Beagle. And you can see here he's highlighted coral atolls in blue and barrier reefs in red. And over time, his map was added to by subsequent explorers and updated and improved over, um, over decades. 
And just to give you an idea of how we're still reliant on some of these really old maps, this map of the Whitsundays was published in 1953, but actually it's a composite of several other maps and draws really heavily from some of Matthew Flinders' charts. And Matthew Flinders, of course, was charting a safe passage through the reef in 1803, so a long time before. And he would have been using um, soundings, um, with like a piece of lead dropped off the side of the boat to try and map. So a big revolution for mapping coral reefs came um, when we were able to start viewing them from above and doing aerial surveys. So in 1947, the Royal Australian Air Force was commissioned taking aerial photographs all over Australia, which meant that this gentleman, Rhodes Fairbridge, was able to um, really start creating some really beautiful detailed habitat maps of um, reefs in the Great Barrier Reef for the first time. So this aerial view really gave us a, a, a unique kind of new perspective on um, reefs. And the next big re revolutionary step in global coral reef mapping really came at the beginning of the 21st century when computing power allowed us to start compiling and digitizing all of those historic navigation charts and maps. And so in the 1990s, the World Conservation Monitoring Center started to collect and digitize all the reef maps that existed to try and create a single um, habitat map of all the world's coral reefs, so an up-to-date one. So I talked about how um, traditional mapping involved looking up at the stars a lot, but the advent of satellites meant we could position imaging sensors in space and look down on Earth to map, which was really exciting too. The Millennium Mapping Project in the early 2000s used high quality cameras on this satellite, which is called Landsat 7, which took 1730 by 30 meter, um, 30 meter pixel images of Earth from which the Millennium Mapping team were able to start um, accurately mapping reefs really on an unprecedented scale. And so by combining the Millennium maps with those Landsat images, with the historical maps that were compiled and digitized by the World Resources Monitoring Center, we finally got to the point in 2009 when we had a new global coral reef map extent for the first time that scientists could use. And you can see here the yellow shows all the outlines of, um, of the different reefs. And that's really where we kind of got to. So this extent map was and still is being used by scientists today, but it does have its limitations. And so, excuse me, ah, the picture of my face is, does have some limitations. Um, so for example, it just provides an outline of the reef. So there's not much information about the different parts and the structure of the reef there. Um, and it hasn't been mapped consistently either because it's been taken from lots of different source material. And so there's some areas that really haven't been mapped to the same level of detail as others. You can see here, this is a map of, uh, this is a satellite image of Heron Island, Heron Reef on the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see that there's actually a lot of deep blue water that's included in that outline as well. So that's a problem too, when we're estimating you know, the, the amount of reefs in the world or the, or the extent. And um, some of the outlines really don't make very much sense at all. And even worse, some reefs have been missed as well. So it's definitely the best thing that's been available to us um, for the past, um, recent years, but definitely not as much information as you'd want as a scientist, because it's not just the outlines of the reefs that are interesting to coral reef scientists, but actually like the shapes and the forms of the reefs, the geomorphology. And so at the same time, um, technology was allowing us to start mapping from below the ocean surface using sonar and LIDAR. And so this is part of um, a really detailed high resolution bathymetry map of the Great Barrier Reef and the Coral Sea that was published in 2009 as well. So it's a hundred meter resolution, um, but it starts to give us a lot more information on um, those reefs than just extents. So to give you an idea of the kind of information that we'd be interested in in our maps, uh, this is Heron Reef again on the Great Barrier Reef. It's got a little research station on it. Uh, on, on the island, and the island's tiny, you can walk around it in about half an hour. 
The reef itself is quite large though, it's about 11 kilometers across. And you can see that the global um, map just currently gives us the extent but actually, when you look at that image, you're going to be missing a lot of variability within that reef if you only have the extent. Um, so things like waves, depth and light help shape um, the kind of organisms that are growing and shape the, uh, shape the reefs themselves as well and help structure what the reef looks like internally. Um, so if you're a diver or a snorkeler, you're probably familiar with this area of the reef. We call this the slope. And so in terms of waves, it's much more exposed. It's deeper and there's less light. And you also get more branching corals. You get larger fish visiting that area. Um, here we'd have the reef crest, which is much shallower. Um, lots of light because it's shallow. Um, and only very kind of sturdy corals can grow there because there's a lot of wave action. The more protected reef flat usually covers big, big areas. And I'm sure you're all familiar with reef lagoons as well. They're kind of sandy sheltered areas. So there's a lot of different habitats there that you'd maybe want to, want to know about or capture in maps. And we call this geomorphic zonation. And actually, if you visited any of these areas like we do in our lab, you'd see they look very, very different. They have different kind of communities of corals living there. And so getting information on um, them and being able to map like this higher level um, of detail would be really, really useful for us. And actually an ecologist like me would be interested in even finer scale differences in habitat. So for example, where different species of corals and algae might be found. Might, might be found. Um, and so we tend to do a lot of underwater surveys and we call this kind of variability um, benthic variation and um, the benthic zonation often matches or mirrors the geomorphic zonation as well. And you can imagine this kind of mapping is very labor intensive, but gives you a huge amount of detail, which can be very useful depending on what your research question is. So traditionally in coral reef mapping, we've kind of had this trade off between detail, which is on the y axis and coverage, which is on the x axis. So we're either producing um, very detailed maps, um, which are often very limited in extent, or else we're producing big regional to global maps, um, but they're really lacking kind of consistency and the spatial resolution that we'd really want. And so it's only really today that computing power and improvements and accessibility and affordability of satellite data has enabled us to start moving up into this area of the graph where um, we're able to start producing while well, attempting to produce detailed and consistently develop very large coverage maps, which is very exciting. Um, so why would it be useful to have a map like this? So currently we're still making statements like Australia has 14% of the world's reefs, um, but those, those kind of values are based on the extent map that I showed you. And you can see straight away that there are some um, issues with that map because it hasn't been consistently made. But there are lots of other reasons besides environmental accounting. So the global extent outline map that I showed you has been used um, to make lots of inferences about reefs. For example, scientists have attempted to assign monetary values to reefs using the outline kind of per meter squared uh, valuation. Um, it's been used to try and estimate the damage from coral bleaching because we can't always go and visit every single reef to see the damage, but we know where um, the worst heat is. And if we know the extent of the reef as well, we can estimate that. Um, it's been used in conservation planning as well. And if you have really fine scale kind of benthic maps, then you're able to ask a lot of more detailed questions about things like reef functioning as well. And so these are all examples of where our analyses could really be refined or scaled with a more accurate and a more detailed coral reef map. But addressing that trade-off between resolution and detail would definitely push the limits of computing power and technology. And for a while, there wasn't anybody that was even crazy enough to attempt such a challenge. 
Um, so this is where I'd like to pause and introduce you to Chris Rolfsimer and Stuart Finn. So Chris and Stuart are faculty at the University of Queensland in the Remote Sensing Research Centre, of which Stuart is the director. And essentially, these two are a team of absolute satellite geeks with over 70 years of remote sensing experience between them. But they also love coral reefs and they're pretty crazy about diving. And since the early 2000s, they've been working really hard to develop a methodology to be able to map their favorite reef, which is Heron Reef again, um, using a combination of satellite imagery that was available at the time um, and also field data and knowledge about the structure of the reef. Um, to be able to create these kind of detailed um, reef maps. And so um, obviously remote sensing underwater is really difficult because of issues with refraction and reflection and how the satellite sensors deal with underwater environments. And so between 2000 and 2018, the team worked and worked and worked with satellites to develop this method so that they were finally able to map um, Heron Reef at 11 kilometer reef that I showed you in um, very fine detail. And once they got this methodology working, they were able to successfully apply the approach to the 20 neighboring reefs in the southern GBR. You can see them popping up there in the south. And if you imagine each little blue dot represents a different reef. Um, so in 2017, um, they managed to scale this to uh, 237 reefs in the Cairns Cooktown sector, which was a big uh, and very exciting leap for coral reef mapping. And currently, the team are attempting to map all of the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, and we should be nearly finished that by Christmas using this methodology that's been developed, which is very exciting. But to take the methodology to the global scale would be a whole different ball game. So clearly trying to scale this up to map all the world's reefs isn't something that we're going to be able to do manually or by hand. And so there are some really big differences in the methodology that we're using um, to do this big jump and try and map all the world's, um, all the world's reefs. Um, and to talk you through the methodology we're using, I'm going to use the cake analogy because I really like cake. So the first step in creating a global coral reef map is um, for your cake, you'll need ingredients. Um, and so our ingredients would be reliable, accurate, high resolution input data. Um, and we actually need somebody to go out and fetch those ingredients for us. So this is introducing you to the planet doves. So these are tiny little nano satellites or cube satellites. And there's a constellation of about 200 of these kind of shoebox sized satellites orbiting Earth at a very low level and imaging every single reef on the planet every single day with a 3.7 meter pixel spatial resolution. So these satellites came from a small startup company called Planet, who managed to source more than 50 million venture capital um, by launching iPhones on rockets, essentially, to, uh, to prove that they could make it work. Uh, the CubeSats are about 60 centimeters by 10 by 10. They first launched in um, 2016, and we're currently on the fifth generation of the satellites and cameras. So they're continually being improved as they launch. Um, they produce... Uh, imagery with very low signal to noise ratio, which is good for us. And what's exciting about this is up until now, um, the space industry and satellites were really just done by kind of big governments and space agencies. And this is a real um, game changer. It's the new kind of cheaper and responsive industry. And so Planet are actually partners on the project and they're providing all the raw data um, for the mapping. And so the ingredients that these little satellites are collecting aren't just pictures. So every pixel, the satellite is collecting a lot of data, a lot of numbers. So data on um, surface reflectance, which gives you information on different spectra, so the amount of blue, green, and red light. And using that kind of information, we can look at things like ratio of green light to blue light to calculate bathymetry. And with the bathymetry, and we're working with a team of modelers as well to give us wave height maps. 
maps. And so that's the kind of raw information, raw ingredients for creating our maps. And if you remember, I talked before about the importance of waves, depth and light in structuring a lot of internal like morphology of reefs or at least being a good indicator of those. So with those three bits of information, we really have quite a good chance of like uh, of mapping reefs in detail. Um, so once you have your ingredients, you need a really solid recipe to follow that's going to determine ultimately what the map looks like. And so um, we needed to come up with a kind of a, a classification system to with very clear rules that are going to um, help us map, map the reefs. And so we're creating three levels of maps. The very first one is just going to be an extent map, just the same as the, um, the one that I showed you, but maps consistently rather than being a composite of lots of other different maps. And so that's just going to show reef and not reef. Uh, the next level of maps are going to show geomorphic zones. So coming up with geomorphic map classes, um, and we're going to go a little bit beyond those four different geomorphic classes that I mentioned earlier. We've actually got 12 different classes that we can determine and thinking about and choosing the correct geomorphic classes to display in our maps was a really important part of the project um, because it depended on what the users were going to need and um, different map users from conservation practitioners to modelers might be interested in different um, parts of the reef or want different classes to be recognizable and useful. So we had to do a lot of reading around this to decide, firstly, what we could actually um, pull from the raw, raw data, but also what was going to be sensible. And the final the third map layer is going to be a benthic map. And so as much as we can from those 3.7 meter pixels, we're going to be um, getting information on whether it's corally kind of habitat or sandy habitat. There's actually six classes in that. Um, and one of the challenges in developing our classification was kind of bridging this divide because we wanted to make maps like this with classes um, that bridge the divide between how coral reef scientists see and understand reefs and all their biological and biophysical features, but also the limitations of what we could detect um, from space using the planet doves. And so um, we used our classification to kind of come up with a rule set about how the classes are defined from a biophysical point of view. So for example, the reef crest, we can say it's always the shallowest part of the reef and it's highly exposed to waves. And those kind of rules can help us um, like create the maps automatically. Um, yeah, so yeah, so part of, a, a large part of it was coming up with the classification and definitions for each of those areas. Next step in um, getting a good recipe was um, we use the traditional methodology that had been developed by our team to create small training maps or reference maps. So we randomly picked small kind of 20 by 20 kilometer areas all across the world. And our team of mappers use something called object-based classification, which is a type of mapping where image data is essentially kind of like um, chopped up into different objects that look similar to each other. And then they're assigned to different classes using those rules that we came up with. Um, and each of those maps will be very carefully manually checked by our teams of mappers to make sure that they make sense because these are the kind of template that we're going to be using to um, map all the reefs at scale. So the next step um, is baking. So for any kind of baking creation, you'll definitely need some serious processing power. Um, to run the analyses. And in fact, the only place on the planet at the moment that has the computing power to be able to process this vast amount of um, ingredients that we're throwing at it is the Google Earth Engine. And so um, the Google Earth Engine uses something called parallel processing on the server side, which means that we can upload all our data and ask the machine to do things for us, but all the big expensive, computationally expensive operations are being run on, um, on Google's side. And um, Google Earth Engine works using something called parallel processing, which essentially just means it kind of chops up all the tasks into little chunks so that it just doesn't get overwhelmed by the amount of, um, the amount of processing that it has to do. 
So on a region by region basis, what we're doing is we're uploading all that data on spectral reflectance, like the colors, the depth and the waves. Um, we're generating a few new layers from that as well. And then we're also throwing in our training maps, our templates that have been created using the traditional method that we developed and double and triple checked by our mappers. And so essentially what the algorithm then does is it looks at the training maps and it looks at the data and it works out like by comparing the training maps to the data, what all the other data should look like. And it automatically produces um, the entire rest of the map from that. So the more training maps we put in, generally the better um, it manages to perform the machine. And after that, there's a little bit of cleaning up and double checking and smoothing to make the map perfect um, before we take a look at it. Um, and so essentially, yeah, we'll start off with something that essentially just looks like this satellite imagery and end up with something that looks like this, a geomorphic map and a benthic map as well. And we're attempting this on a region by region basis, just because regionally there's some quite big differences in the kind of types and structures of reefs you get. Um, and so it's helping the machine perform better by doing it. And also because it can't, it wouldn't be able to process everything at the same time. So like any good baking, when you create something, you want to have a little taste to see what can be improved. And so as each region is produced, we really need to check and verify it um, using real world data and experts as well. And so having actual field training data is a really important part of this process as well. And actually that's a large part of my role is um, taking the teams into the field to collect georeference information. Essentially, we're just going to visit the pixels to double check actually what is in those pixels and is it what we're telling, um, telling the machine that is in those pixels and double check as well. And so the field training data is really important for assessing the new maps and checking that they're performing well, but also for training the algorithm correctly to classify. And the nice thing about being able to go out into the field as well is um, we can also just take a look at the health of the reef while we're out there and seeing how it's changing as well. And so again, when I tell mom and dad that I'm off on field work again, I'm pretty sure they think this is what I'm up to. Um, and you'd think that island hopping in the Sunshine State would be pretty sunny, but I'm sure as many of you are aware, field work on the Great Barrier Reef isn't always very fun. And remote working often means you get to share amenities with um, some of those different animals that I was talking about. Um, and some of them like to bite you. So here we've got a lovely sea snake in the swains that was very interested in what our mapping team was up to and wanted to come and help. Essentially, what we do when we're in the field is um, we have a GPS on an uh, orange float, um, which is pretty much just tied to tied around our waist. And then we'll swim large long transects taking photographs. And so each of those images will be pretty precisely georeferenced and that will create our field training data. So lots and lots of swimming in our lab. And when we come back from um, diving or snorkeling across a reef, we'll spend a lot of time uploading, collating, and organizing all that data in a way that we can start using it to um, double check the mapping, which again, if you get seasick like I do, it's sometimes the most challenging <laughs> part of the job. Uh, because of COVID, it meant that our team couldn't get to a lot of the field sites that we hoped to. And um, 30 regions already was too much for us to go and for our small team to go and visit anyway. So we've been reaching out to um, other coral reef researchers all across the world to see if they could help us to see if they had any georeference photo data we could see to check our maps, if they had local maps of reefs that we could use to validate ours. And so with the help of National Geographic, we've been enlisting like lots of volunteers and partners all over the world. Uh, we've been sending out toolkits and instructions so we can harness local knowledge to try and make these maps better. And it's actually been really fun to see how great the community has responded. We've got a lot of engagement and people, because they know their local reefs really well, are able to pick up um, when we're making mistakes or an algorithm 
create um, maps that don't look quite right so that we can go back and try, uh, try again, feed it some more training data. So the final part of baking and Coral Reef Atlas is the cooks, of course. And so UQ has quite a large and really diverse team involved in the mapping from um, people like me, ecologists running the field expeditions and helping define the mapping classes based on knowledge of geomorphology, um, to helping develop the classes, to expert mappers, um, to technicians, people creating the training maps and preparing and processing those really large data sets as well. And of course, this is a big collaborative project. And so we're part of a broader collaboration with five partners. So Planet, I already mentioned, provide all that daily satellite imagery for us. We also work with Arizona State University, uh, led by Greg Asner, um, who does a lot of the cleanup work on that initial satellite imagery, um, creating like really clean, nice mosaics with no clouds in them and all at the same like tide level that get then passed on to our team at UQ for inputting into the mapping process. And when we finish creating our maps and checking them, we'll pass them along to Vulcan. And Vulcan are uh, based in America and they're funding the project, but they also host the web platform where all the data are being made publicly available. And final partner are National Geographic. And so they're leading all the kind of engagement, making sure that the maps and their products are being found by people that need them and um, getting converted into real world outcomes and also feeding feedback back to our team um, people have um, comments or notice things that aren't quite working. And in case you're wondering why I've been referring to it as the Allen Coral Atlas, I had to mention the late Paul Allen, who is the co-founder of Microsoft and Vulcan is his philanthropic company. So he loved the ocean. He was really upset about what was happening to coral reefs. Um, he understood that uh, having really detailed habitat maps could help conservation. Um, and so the Alan Crow Atlas was really his vision and his legacy. And we lost him a short time into the project, which was really sad for everybody on the team. Um, so we began mapping back late in 2017. And we're pretty much on track for completion midway through next year. So there's a QR code that I just put up in the top um, right. And if you scan it with your phone, it should take you directly to the website if you want to have a play, or you can just check out alancoralatlas.org later. So yellow shows the locations of all the um, reefs on the world. And of course, we started just with um, some kind of proof of concept reefs. Heron Island was, of course, the first, just to check that this was going to be realistic and feasible. And then after that, we divided the world's reefs into 30 big chunks. And um, this is kind of where we're at at the moment. In fact, we've just delivered, which is really exciting, the Indonesia maps and um, the Central Indian Ocean maps over to Vulcan. So they should be appearing on our website really soon. And that's a huge amount of reef area that's been mapped and a lot of very complicated kind of um, reefs there as well. So if you do make it onto the website, the full clean low tide mosaic, which is the satellite imagery is available for all the reefs. So you can already have a go at playing around and zooming in and out of the reefs already. And where reefs have been mapped, you'll be able to see the geomorphic zones and the benthic zones mapped as well. And if you're interested in accessing and using that data for your own research, you can draw um, polygons around the reefs that you're interested in and download all that, um, all that data in lots of different useful formats for you. And so I wanted to just kind of finish up by mentioning some positive things that have come out of this, um, of this atlas. So in January, um, this little area in Sri Lanka, which was one of actually our kind of test proof of concept areas, really excitingly um, got declared a national park. And the team in Sri Lanka that had asked us specifically to map these reefs uh, got in touch with us to say that they'd used the map as a basis um, to petition the government to make that happen. So that was a really exciting, positive thing that happened. Um, back in July, this made the news, I don't know if you remember, there was a Japanese owned bulk carrier that ran aground off the coast of Mauritius and it spilled about a thousand tons of oil into the 
ocean and endanger some of the world's most pristine reefs and lagoons. And so we worked with Planet at the time to be able to try and provide a kind of oil spill response kit with a lot of data, spatial data on, on the reefs that were there and imagery of the oil spill as it happened and the benthic area of where we thought there were corals there and what was going to be affected. And it, I mean, that was a bit depressing because I think it's not very nice to be able to see these things happening in your imagery from space and not being able to go and actually help with the cleanup practically, but we're hoping some of these tools will be useful to people working um, on the ground there. Recently, we mapped large parts of Micronesia, which is exciting because it's been helping the seven nations of Micronesia with um, their Micronesia Challenge, which is an effort to get 30% of their reefs into protected areas. And so the process, had, they'd already started this um, years ago, and they've been using um, local maps. But one of the problems with that is that every time they wanted to have a meeting about where they were going to um, place marine protected areas, they had to fly a GIS expert in um, for the community meetings to be able to manipulate and show people those maps. And so what's been cool about having all these maps freely available and explorable on this web platform is it's just really empowered the communities to start having those resources at their fingertips so that they can start discussing conservation planning straight away without having to rely on waiting to, um, to fly in GIS. Expert. So there's been some really nice positive stories and I think what the team always hoped that um, that as, as well as just baking and delivering a cake, um, the vision was really to be more of a kind of hub to bring people together and a real tool for coral scientists and policy makers and so um, some other organizations have put some of their data onto the website as well. One of the most exciting ones is um, the NOAA Coral Reef Watch data layers, which is a US organization, have really nice information on where, um, on a daily basis, areas are warming and they have um, bleaching alerts. Um, so that's, it's just made it very accessible and um, quite like user friendly for people as well to access that information now. Everything's um, free and hopefully easy to download. Uh, we've been working with some other teams as well to see if we can even start having people upload information um, or learn how to create their own maps as well. And with National Geographic, we've been developing some teaching resources, which are really fun as well for people that um, want to get a little bit more um, experience with playing with some of that spatial data as well. So that just got released last week. And so really, that was um, my hope with tonight, that um, now that you have a good idea of how the Atlas was made and how to navigate the site, um, I just really hope that you might go and check it out and play on the website and um, let us know what it might be useful for or what you'd like to change. And I put an email address up there if you did have feedback. Um, we also could do with help. So we're looking for um, data poor regions at the moment where we don't have very much training data. And of course, the more data we have, the better the maps come out. So at the moment, um, we, we were supposed to go to the Red Sea um, to collect a lot of our own data. And so, but because of COVID, we can't. Um, and so, yeah, the next couple of regions that are coming up were the South China Sea and the Red Sea. Um, but even if you um, know about existing um, georeference data sets that might be useful or it could even link us to policy or decision makers who might be interested in using the maps that would be really great as well and if you know your local reef really well you can definitely help um, spot errors and help us improve the maps and of course I mean these maps are really designed for like big scale analyses they're never going to be as good as you know like a local detailed map that somebody has spent a lot of time making so it's never going to be perfect but getting feedback means that we can sometimes like try and improve the algorithm as well and we can't always resolve every issue but it can it can be useful um and so we're not quite finished there the maps should be hopefully finished by july next year um, but we're hoping that this is going to be a kind of a flexible tool that's going to continue to be updated as the technology improves 
Uh, I would really have loved to show Darwin the Atlas. And um, now that we have all these amazing remote sensing and computing capabilities, our fingertips, how far we've built on his original map. And I just wanted to finish with these two inspirational quotes by two very inspirational people. So Paul Allen, I already introduced you to as the co-founder of Microsoft. And Ruth Gates was the director of um, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And um, the Atlas was also kind of her baby as well. So she's very miffed as well. Um, so sometimes as somebody who really loves reefs, you can get quite sad because I feel like we're monitoring destruction of the wild places that we love. Um, and you need a really special kind of person like Ruth, who had a very strong belief in the power of collaboration for the greater good. Um, so I think that's everything for now. Thank you very much for listening. Everybody's still awake. And I'll hand over for questions, I guess, Arachne. Sorry, I talked for a very long time. <laughs> that's fine you're just just short of an hour emma so that that's fine wow what an amazing presentation um a, a real window into this uh, wonderful technology uh, and it's certainly so powerful and you've explained it so uh, well that uh, people like us who have no idea what uh, what's been going on can understand it so thank you so much um, I think we probably do have a few questions, but I might start the ball rolling while um, other members of the audience might like to pen some questions. So um, you, you've given us some um, uh, insights into Heron, where I know you've been working recently. Um, but could I ask, you know, when you say the reefs are changing and um, because of lots of influences, but climate change and even day to day, I guess, reefs can change. So can you give us some idea of how you um, incorporate, you might incorporate changes in the Atlas? It's such a wide ranging uh, project and <laughs> that must be difficult to sort of look at change. That's a really good question. And there's, yeah, change on different time scales as well. So a lot of those big kind of geomorphic structures are gonna be, once we've mapped them, they're gonna be pretty stable for the next hundred years or so, but you're completely right with the, a lot of those benthic components. They're changing naturally. Sometimes you have algae, algae blooms in the summer and disappearing, and then they're also degrading over time as well and actually one part of the project that I didn't have a chance to mention which is really being run by Arizona State University our other partner was seeing whether we could use some of um, that daily planet satellite imagery to see if we could detect changes particularly with the coral bleaching because there's a big obvious change in color there where we see a lot of brightening and um, it's been tricky to do because we're working with quite big pixel sizes so nearly five meters, so you can't really see individual corals, but um, you, you can see here on the images, you can start to pick up like slightly different changes. It's been kind of tricky to do, but um, they've managed to do it in Hawaii that bleached really badly last year. And you can see here, this bleaching tool is just seeing different weeks and where they're seeing a change in the, the brightening essentially of the imagery that's probably indicating that those reefs are those reefs are bleaching. Okay, thanks. What a long way we've come since Darwin. <laughs> we did a pretty amazing job with not many tools, the amount of stuff that we've got on our yeah. fingertips now. Sure, so I'll go to the, the chat questions here. We had one right at the beginning from Ray Andrews, interested to know the largest uh, Great Barrier Reef individual coral reef. What is the most southerly, southerly coral reef and the most diverse? Well, Did you get that question? Yeah, so I think the most southerly reefs are like that are true reefs and that aren't rocks with reefs growing on them are probably around Lady Musgrave Island. That's kind of out of, um, um, yeah, and the largest reef on the Great Barrier Reef 
I should know I should know that, but I'm not sure. But what's going to be interesting is when we've remapped all those Great Bear Reef maps, it will probably change because you saw some of those extents overestimated the size of some of those reefs as well. Mm. And do you have an idea of which is the most diverse at the moment from your from your research? Mm. Or so generally there's a like in terms of coral diversity, there's actually sort of genetic um genetic like links that go from north to south so the north was always um had greater species diversity but it's been a lot worse hammered in the recent bleaching events and so at the moment in terms of reef health and cover and fish the southern great barrier reef is still doing very well so yeah visiting heron island last um last week was looking it was looking very healthy oh that's good news um a comment here from lauren Beatty. Thank you, Emma, that was really fascinating. As a former Grubumpa employee and about to start a Bachelor in Marine Science, I'm particularly interested in coral reef ecology and mapping technologies. You've inspired me and given me a lot of food for thought. Thank oh, you. Fantastic, that's great. Um, from Steve Turton, um, who's a member of our council RGSQ Council now, and you may know Steve from James Cook. Thanks, Emma, a fantastic and inspirational presentation. Good luck with your new role at Ames. Thank you. Okay, now a question from John Fairbairn, one of our RGSQ members. Fantastic presentation. How far into the temperate zones of the planet do you extend? For example, southern areas of Australia, for example. That's a really good question. And we had to draw a line or make a decision about defining what like what is a reef and where do we draw that line. And so we've drawn it at the, um, the 30 degree like parallel, um, which means that we are missing lots of temperate reefs for sure. So for example, just here on our doorstep in Brisbane in um, Moreton Bay, we've got Flinders Reef and lots of reefs in Moreton Bay as well. And they won't be mapped, which is a shame. So there are limitations to this to this map certainly and deep water reefs aren't getting mapped either like you know the light only penetrates a certain depth into the into the water so we're only really mapping to 10 meters so we're missing a lot of deep water reefs as well yeah okay thank you from ray andrews a question pink coralline algae any symbiotic relationships with archaea organisms so did I pronounce that correctly? Oh. They're still being, yeah, they're still, it's still being investigated because they, what's interesting about the coralline algae is that they output a lot of like chemical cues that attract new coral larvae to come and settle on them. Um, and they think that there might be interactions with bacteria or other organisms on the surface of the algae. They don't have a symbiotic relationship like the corals do with um, dinoflagellates inside them, but it could be. It's something that's very understu understudied on the reef at the moment. People have been very preoccupied with the colorful fish in the corals and it's the seaweeds that always like, get a little bit more neglected, <laughs> need more research. We might ask you about that little pink seaweed at the end here. <laughs> Um, okay, from Pam Tonkin, who is also a counsellor for the RGSQ. Emma, that was fascinating. I understand the difficulty in compiling the recipe. The development of a schema is most important and takes in an inordinate amount of time. So thank you. Another question from Ray Andrews. How often do you get imagery updates? That's a good question as well. And so um, we're working pretty much with a 2018 like imagery mainly. We have just put the 2019 imagery um, and made that available to everybody on the on the website. And we can ask Planet for. Um, I mean, they're producing imagery daily. If you go onto the Planet website, they have access to daily imagery, and they can. Give it to you on a daily basis which is really exciting when I don't know did you guys remember there was a big pumice stone raft that was floating towards Australia at one at one point and we were able to watch it every day like moving closer and breaking up um, but in terms of making that data ex 
accessible to people. There's a lot of cleaning. So even though every single reef is being imaged on a daily basis, generally if there's clouds there, you can't see through the clouds or if it's like a really windy day and there's lots of waves or there's too much sun glint, we throw away a lot of those images. As you mentioned, the 170 little satellites going around all the time. Yeah. So they are sending back images. Yes, every single day or every every three uh, three point seven meters on Earth, and so Planet have this huge resource um, that they're sharing for different projects. So if you're interested in that, I would definitely recommend going um, just googling um, Planet and going to their website. And um, it's been really fun for looking at things like the bushfires on a daily basis as well. And yeah, it's a very very powerful tool. So we're lucky to be partnered with them. Okay, um, another question from uh, one of our, actually our, the secretary of our society, our council member. Thank you for a great presentation, Emma, from John Tasker. What is the next challenge you are hoping to solve once the world's reefs are mapped? <laughs> Well, one thing, so for my new role that I'm really excited about, and it's building a little bit on what we're doing, um, is one of the problems is, I mean, we're, we're trying to detect coral bleaching from space, but it, it doesn't work really well with the satellite imagery at the moment. What we really need when, so for example, when the Great Barrier Reef bleached this March, there's only a certain number of scientists and the reef is huge, it's the size of Italy. And so getting people into the water to be able to, let us know what's happening and understand the bleaching better and where the reef is being damaged and where the reef isn't is a real problem. And so we've been using artificial um, intelligence, kind of a bit like the facial recognition technology on Facebook um, to encourage people to, to go out and take their own photographs of the reefs and they can upload them to this AI that we're creating. Um, and then um, it can automatically analyze that data and tell you what species you have in your photograph as well. And so it suddenly makes, um, gives us lots and lots of eyes essentially, and we can suddenly scale up what we're able to go into the water and actually do. Because as far as we've got with Planet kind of bridging that gap between making things more detailed and scalable, it's still, not quite at the level of detail that we'd really like and so yeah that's the next that's the next challenge is yeah harnessing citizen science to try and be able to get more information on the reef and how it's changing i imagine that will keep you busy for quite a while <laughs> i think so <laughs> um, from craig shepherd again fantastic presentation emma thank you your illustrations of scale in source data Classification of imagery combined with your field surveys to build your coral product were spot on. And congratulations on your new role with Ames. Cheers, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Um, another question from John Fairburn. Where in the world are the most pristine reefs, do you think? Oh, that's a really good question as well. We used to think as coral scientists that the most pristine ones were the ones that were furthest away from anybody else. And so places like the Line Islands in the Pacific where Palmyra Atoll were often touted as completely pristine because for a long while, the biggest threats were things like overfishing and coastal development and things that were related to people. So reefs that were really isolated were more pristine. And then unfortunately, as the oceans have been getting warmer and warmer um, and ocean warming and coral bleaching has become a really big problem. A lot of those reefs were, um, were really badly damaged in the, in the 2018 um, global coral, 2016 global coral bleaching event and so yeah so no longer is being far away from people necessarily a good thing for reefs so yeah I'm not sure I don't think there's anywhere that's undamaged now which is which is sad mm. but yes indeed uh, I think you covered this already in your answer previously but Ray Andrews uh, commented planet data has daily coverage mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, from Debbie, thank you, Emma. What a brilliant presentation, packed full with great detail. I worked in remote sensing for many years. 
before recently moving into teaching. In our geography classes, we use GIS and various data sets to explore coral reefs as part of a unit on monitoring environmental change. Are any of your Atlas data layer layers available for export into other GIS systems like ArcGIS? Absolutely, yeah, they all are downloadable and exportable. Um, and that's so exciting that you're teaching that you're teaching these kind of skills to the next generation. Because yeah, it was a very steep learning curve for me as an ecologist joining a remote sensing lab and um, there's so much exciting stuff you can do with these tools so yes definitely if you'd like to give me an email later I can send you the links to some of the lesson plans that we've got as well but um, yeah at the moment the only thing we're struggling with with the downloads is if you um, if you want to download an area that's bigger than 10,000 square kilometers you just like don't have the capacity to like send it out to people so we're working on working on getting that but otherwise if you check out the website everything that you can see from the satellite imagery to the um, to the maps that can be I think they're available as shape files geojsons and um, KML files as well and they'll just be emailed to you and you can use them however you like so I'd be very excited to hear if you're if you're using them that would be great. That's wonderful we do have connections with um, lots of teachers geography teachers so uh, it's really exciting variety, and um, I think we would like also if you can email me the data that uh, email as well please Emma I'll share it with more of our teacher members and um, networks that sounds like a really great idea we've been looking to yeah to connect more with teachers so i'm so glad that there's teachers in the audience tonight thank you yes thank you um one more uh, just uh, i think we have time for just a couple more questions there's three more here on the chat from Je uh, john again you may have already covered the answer to this though are there any reasons why the map would not be able to move further towards the poles with adequate resources. I think that when you covered, you know, why aren't you doing the temperate zones? So the only, yeah, the only problem that we do have is when we move into more temperate zones is to turbidity. So if the water's cloudy or unclear, uh, we can't and we can't see the reefs through the water, then we can't map them. And if of course, when you get to more temperate zones, there's more nutrients because of those colder water and more mixing. Um, as long as, because it's daily imagery, if there's one day where the water's clear and you can see, then we can map from it. But we have had problems even with sections of um, mapping Sri Lanka, some of the reefs around there, we just haven't been able to map them because the water's been too cloudy, too turbid. And so that probably would be the, the main kind of logistical, kind of technical challenge to do, to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, from e Ikeda, thank you, Emma. Is there any coral reef habitat area change due to temperature rise? And I'm so sorry about the incident, as I'm Japanese. So sad. I think she means the. Oh, yeah, but that's not, it was just an accident. It's a very sad accident. An accident. <laughs> <laughs> and like, those oil spills, they happen all the time. There's so much traffic nowadays. It's just, yeah, being able to get a better, better view of them. And so what we are seeing is, um, yeah, not, not changes in those big geomorphic structures, um, but with temperature changes, what we are seeing is shifts in the benthic communities, so the, the corals and things. And so we're seeing a lot of corals dying as it's getting too warm for them. Um, and so like a yeah a loss of corals and if enough corals die we can we can see that from the satellite imagery um and as temperature changes we're seeing range expansions in a lot of different species as well and so there's some evidence that um that some corals are kind of migrating so in japan they found some species that are moving i think it's about a meter a year it's an, it's amazing up into cooler areas so lots of scientists are investigating whether some of those kind of more marginal habitats might be kind of refugia for corals in the future but of course when you go more north there's more turbidity and corals really need very very clear water to grow so it's a complicated one Lots of good things happening in Japan, Ikeda, I think. <laughs> uh, and I think we might make this, I think it is the last question and we are 
um, getting on and we really need to give Emma a bit of a, a rest, I think, from Pamela Tonkin again. I heard about a project to get tour boats and volunteer snorkelers to take part in a study off the coast of Cairns. Is that of any use to you? That's so useful to us. Yes, I think I've heard of that one and it's called the Great Reef Census. And so this year they're going to try and like blitz and send lots and lots of people out with cameras all over the Great Barrier Reef and just do a big blitz. And uh, they're going to be giving a lot of that information to us and to the team um, at AIMS that are going to be developing the, the AI to see if we can start like, um, yeah, so yeah. The answer is yes, that's going to be very useful. It's very exciting. So there's there's space for everybody to get involved and help out and become a citizen scientist and contribute, which is nice. Okay, thanks. I think we might make that one the last question. Um, so look, could you could you all um, maybe um, unmute and uh, give Emma a round of a rous rousing round? of applause for such a fantastic um, presentation to us all. Can you all do that? Oh, lovely. I don't know if you, know if you can <laughs> hear it. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving up your evenings. And again, thanks to everyone for um, joining in, participating and, and being an audience tonight. And again, Emma, good luck with your new position. I hope you will keep in touch with the RGSQ when time permits. I know you are very busy. <laughs> um, could I just also just finally uh, remind everybody that um, we do have our calendar, our RGSQ calendar. And um, I think some members of the audience tonight do have their photos uh, in the calendar. I don't know why it's coming up back to front. But anyway, <laughs> that's Straddy on the front page. There's still some uh, available for purchase. So if you could look at um, sending in an order, uh, that would be most um, appreciated. I think if Ken is there, Ken Granger, two of yours got into the calendar. So Ken, we look out for your order. <laughs> but anyway, thanks again, Emma, and to everybody in the audience. And I wish you all um, a very good break over Christmas, and I do hope that um, our situation continues to be eased um, next year, and we hope to look forward to you, many of you in person next year, and have a very good Christmas and New Year. Thank you all. Thank you. Same to you, Bethany.